Hello and welcome to today's Federal Society virtual event. Today, July 6th, 2023, we are excited to present a courthouse steps decision recap in the case of Arizona v. Navajo Nation. My name is Jack Apizi, and I'm an assistant director of practice groups at the Federalist Society. As always, please note that all expressions of opinion are those of the speakers on today's call. After our speakers have given their remarks, we will turn to you, the audience, for any questions you might have. If you do have a question at any point, please type it into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and we'll handle them as we can towards the end of today's program. Today, we're delighted to be joined by AJ Ferrati, who is of counsel at Spencer Fane as well as Jennifer Weddle, who is a shareholder and co-chair of the American Indian Law Practice Group at Greenberg Traurig. With that, thank you all for being with us. Jennifer, over to you. Thank you so much to the Federalist Society and to AJ for doing this webinar with me today. Um, we thought that we'd divide it up a little bit and provide some more background and context since Indian water rights are not necessarily uh, in everyone's range of expertise. Uh, so I'm gonna walk through that. I have a lot of pictures uh, for all of you visual learners and you uh, may recognize some people you know in these pictures. Um, talk through the background of how Indian water rights have developed uh, and then provide the overview of what happened at the district court proceedings in Arizona here and at the Ninth Circuit. And then AJ is going to take us through the three uh, separate opinions uh, from the US Supreme Court in the case. Um, so first off, um, the overview of Indian water rights. It's rooted in federal law, uh, including Aboriginal title uh, to land and water as recognized in the United States. Um, it's also been hallmarked by the deep conflicts between Indian and non-Indian rights and uses, uh, and um, is, is founded in Indian treaties, agreements, statutes, and executive orders um, and has also been the subject of very expensive and very lengthy litigation. And resultantly, most Indian water rights uh, are now um, settled uh, in congressional acts um, that involve multiple uh, decades of negotiations um, between congressional, executive, and, and tribal uh, folks, along with states, municipal users, agriculture interests, uh, et cetera. And I'll, I'll talk more about some of those specifics in a second. Um, so the origins of, of Western water law. Um, in the arid West, areas of water use uh, were located far from sources of supply very frequently, particularly for miners and irrigators who would build diversions, um, small dams and move water to areas of need. Uh, and that uh, really first in time, first in right, uh, coming out of mining carried over into water rights and the doctrine of prior appropriation was born um, through westward expansion in the mid uh, to late uh, 1800s. Um, the foundational concept uh, is that water is the basis for development in the West, uh, that water would be um, contained in massive uh, public works and that, that uh, those public works would found uh, and, and support uh, continued Western uh, expansion and development. Um, the architect of all this was of course, John Wesley Powell, um, who was the, the godfather of those large federally funded uh, water storage projects that formed the basis for the development of Western cities like Los Angeles, Phoenix, and Las Vegas, uh, perhaps most famously. Um, those are certainly not always the best examples of urban planning uh, based upon water availability and now uh, water scarcity um, <clears throat> uh, here in the West. Uh, but that continued availability of adequate and reliable municipal and industrial water supplies to meet that population growth in the West is really the underpinning of all economic life uh, in the West. I'm trying to go to the next slide. Um, state water law, you know, as I say, kind of grew up around this idea of prior appropriation. Um, literally miners and irrigators would handwrite out 
uh, notices of what water they were using uh, based on availability of water. And that's, that's very theoretical. Again, the water they were using was often distant from the place that they were putting the water to use uh, to some beneficial use where the water was being used for a productive purpose. Um, they had to use that water continuously or lose their priority right to it. And they had to use it with reasonable efficiency. It had to be somehow in the in the general public interest. Um, but that was really subject to very little enforcement and very little regulation. In fact, it was Wyoming that passed the first water code in the United States in 1890. Um, <clears throat> There's a very mixed set of water systems in the United States, water laws that govern um, the various structures on a state-by-state -state basis. And you can see them um, on this 2014 uh, Department of Energy map, um, which shows you that in areas of water abundance, uh, they follow a pure riparian or regulated riparian uh, structure. And in places of water scarcity, scarcity they follow that uh, pure prior appropriation, or um, they moved to prior appropriation and were formerly riparian. Um, Hawaii has its own uh, set of water laws, and there's some mixed uh, riparian prior appropriation states that uh, divide generally along geographic lines, again, by water scarcity uh, or abundance. And you can see that they correlate very closely um, to how much water is actually in a, a geographic area. Um, and of course that water includes water to fulfill Indian treaties. Um, it's very clear, uh, has been for more than a hundred years that there are Indian reserved water rights based on federal law. And that's the so-called winter's doctrine that I'll talk more about um, that Water rights are associated with the establishment of Indian reservations for agricultural purposes. And there's also many other types of uh, Indian water rights, including rights to in-stream flows, sometimes called Winans rights, uh, rights that are associated uh, most particularly with Northwest uh, fisheries. Um, and noting that a lot of this is further complicated by early, um, earlier, uh, legal governance under Spanish law up to 1821 or Mexican law up to 1846 as to the, the Pueblos uh, in the Southwest. Um, the seminal case is Winters versus United States uh, from 1908, uh, which related to the Fort Belknap Indian Reservation, which you can hopefully see on your screen is, is right here in North Central Montana. Uh, and there, the United States brought suit to enjoin uh, ongoing withdrawals from uh, agricultural interests on the Milk River, uh, arguing that they were preventing that water from making it downstream uh, for agricultural use on the Fort Belknap Reservation, where uh, agriculture to this day uh, remains the number one economic driver uh, on the reservation. Um, in 1908, the uh, court held on a uh, seven to one basis that uh, the tribe's water rights were established uh, from the date the reservation was established, uh, that the tribe could not lose those rights uh, from non-use. And as it was more fully developed in later cases, uh, the Winters Doctrine holds that when the federal government broadly sets aside land for an Indian reservation or other particular purpose, it reserves water under federal law sufficient to meet those purposes as well. Um, Post-winter's developments, um, lots of open-ended court decrees, um, recognition that allotments also carry water rights with them and that those water rights are transferable. Um, there's extensive non-Indian development through the Bureau of Reclamation, but tribal rights in that process have routinely been ignored. Uh, and the U.S. has generally had a very poor record in developing and protecting Indian water. How are those uh, tribal rights quantified? Um, in an original jurisdiction case, first filed with the court in 1952, Arizona v. California, uh, the court ultimately entered a decree uh, related to the Colorado River <clears throat> and endorsed a quantification method called practically irrigable acreage, or PIA, uh, recognizing tribes' rights to the amount of water necessary to irrigate 
all the land within the reservation that could be feasibly, feasibly and economically irrigated. And that includes both on reservation and off reservation so sources of water necessary to accomplish uh, those purposes. Uh, and elements of the practically irrigable acreage standard were also later litigated in Wyoming State Court to quantify the rights of the Northern Arapaho and Eastern Shoshone tribes. Um, and that case also uh, went up to the US Supreme Court. And again, the PIA standard was, was upheld. Um, in this mix are the specific treaty uh, promises uh, to the Navajo Nation by the United States. Um, for many years, and a lot of this history is recounted in uh, Justice Gorsuch's dissenting opinion, which AJ uh, will delve into, uh, but Navajos defended their land against incursions, um, including against livestock raiders, and things markedly changed uh, when the U.S. Army arrived in Navajo territory in 1848. Um, the United States and Navajos uh, have signed two Senate ratified treaties. The first in 1849 placed the Navajos forever, that's a quote from the treaty, uh, quote, under the exclusive jurisdiction and protection, end quote, of the United States and promised to establish a reservation. Um, between 1863 and 1866, however, um, there were intensive hostilities between uh, the Navajo Nation and the United States, and over some um, five, almost five dozen separate marches, the army rounded up uh, nearly 12,000 Diné people uh, and marched them more than 300 miles to a desolate uh, reservation at Bosque Redondo in New Mexico. Um, there were very inhospitable uh, conditions there, um, including very poor water, um, you know, really inhuman conditions. And in 1868, the Navajo Nation became the only Native nation to use a treaty to escape removal and return to their uh, original homelands. Um, this is the actual picture of the treaty, which was written on uh, an army ledger book. Uh, the 1868 treaty established the Navajo reservation in their ancestral high desert homeland as the tribe's permanent home. Uh, that's an area that encompasses uh, acreage roughly equivalent to the size of the state of West Virginia, a very large space, largest reservation in the United States. Um, that treaty promised that by giving up the nomadic life outside the reservation, the, Navajo, the Navajos could return to their farming uh, way of life on, the, on part of their ancestral home um, with government provided seeds and agricultural implements. And uh, during the negotiations, um, General uh, Sherman, who led the negotiations for the United States, um, specifically addressed the water issues and those uh, treaty uh, history documents are also cited in Justice Gorsuch's opinion, again, as, as AJ will discuss. Um, but there's a lot of focus in both opinions on what it means to be promised a permanent home and what, if any, duties um, the United States would have to uh, maintain the uh, suitability of that home and particularly to secure water. Um, the Navajo Nation uh, attempted multiple times to get its interests asserted in um, the Arizona v. California litigation. Um, all those motions were denied by the U.S. Supreme Court and opposed uh, by the United States Department of Justice, uh, which uh, did uh, assert interests on behalf of five other uh, Indian tribes, but not on behalf of the Navajo Nation, despite uh, repeated requests and attempts to compel them uh, to do so. Um, and that um, generally followed the same um, process for those tribes that whose rights were adjudicated in Arizona v. California under that PIA standard, um, where they uh, received uh, paper water rights sufficient to meet the present and future needs of the reservation. Um, and you can see on, on this map, um, the areas that were uh, adjudicated 
in the Arizona v. California decree uh, and the tribes that have adjudicated water rights and those that uh, did not, obviously the Navajo Nation not included. Um, these are very complicated adjudication uh, processes that include um, classification of lands um, and, and what is available. Um, engineering feasibility on, on what would be necessary uh, to irrigate arable lands, um, lots of analysis of the economic feasibility of irrigation on those lands, um, and just technical uh, susceptibility for irrigation. Um, the PIA calculations vary wildly, um, especially as to economic feasibility. Um, and that conflicts uh, with the economic uh, feasibility requirements uh, of the Reclamation Act of 1902, which provided significant federal subsidies to make non-Indian irrigation practicable in much of the West. Uh, whereas uh, under the PIA standard, tribes are never uh, allowed uh, similar uh, subsidy um, the implications of, of PIA on tribal lands, it's, it's, as I say, the only sole quantification standard endorsed by the U.S. Supreme Court. It's not necessarily the exclusive, exclusive method of quantification. Uh, the Arizona Supreme Court held in its 2001 decision in the Gila River uh, general adjudication that the primary purpose of the reservation there was to provide a homeland, not agriculture. Um, so it was a lesser amount of water that they came to. Um, but PIA nonetheless drives perception of tribes quantifiable uh, water rights uh, and e elevates those economic considerations over traditional or cultural concerns. Um, and then when PIA is combined with the mandatory state court adjudication of tribal water rights by the McCarran Amendment, um, you get a, a framework that broadly encourages settlements over litigation because um, litigation is very expensive uh, last decades and uh, results in no infrastructure. It, it results in paper water, not wet water, uh, as real water uh, law lawyers would describe it. Um, the McCarran Amendment uh, generally provided a waiver of the United States sovereign immunity and required um, that state courts would be the forum to adjudicate uh, water rights, including federal and state interests. Um, all that litigation, of course, takes place within uh, what is the generally accepted framework of the persistent uh, federal conflict of interest, because the United States uh, would simultaneously be representing the interests of the tribes. Uh, as well as the interests of the Bureau of Land Management and other bodies. Um, uh, and as, as I'm sure AJ will expound upon, uh, there's a lot of language in the opinion, uh, majority opinion here about what it means to be a sovereign trustee or a fiduciary and, and what it doesn't mean if you're a sovereign and also a trustee or a fiduciary. Um, and really what all of that underscores is that these tend to be much more political than legal questions. Um, since 1978, since the Bighorn uh, adjudications, um, there've been 40 tribal water rights settlements, uh, about 40 that have been through um, with either congressional or court approval. Um, by comparison in that time, there've been just three finalized general stream adjudications. Um, including Arizona v. California, the Bighorn cases, and the Mescalero Apache tribes uh, water rights. Uh, since 1989, it has been the U.S. presidential policy to always seek settlements over litigation in terms of Indian water law. There's little tribal inclusion in any of the federal projects that are out there. Um, they're typically not consulted or included in the formation of the interstate compacts um, that quite arguably curtail tribal uses of water. Um, the tribes rarely benefit from those projects. Um, there's a lack of tribal water allocation in those federal uh, water projects. And of course, Indian country is, is routinely entirely left out of infrastructure uh, for water delivery. Uh, more problems. Um, typically in the congressional settlement approach, 
uh, approach. Um, the premise is the Indian tribes give up their very early priority dates to very large volumes of water. Um, they settle claims against the United States for those, and in return, they get money uh, in settlement for those claims uh, so that they can build out basic water infrastructure. Um, but often that's been done without adequate funding or development plans, and the Bureau of Reclamation has proven to be uh, not the best uh, project manager, and we routinely see uh, cost overruns as uh, water infrastructure projects, particularly in the desert southwest, uh, end up costing much, much more uh, than uh, Congress uh, and the parties had anticipated in their settlement acts. Um, there's a lot of pressure on tribal governments to do this and that uh, settlements include all tribal water, past, present, and future. So um, that it's a, it's a very uh, politically fraught process uh, with a lot of negotiation and planning um, and um, requires the tribes and, and all parties to deal with the undeveloped portions of, of tribal allocations um, when in many instances, the water is already over appropriated uh, by junior, but developed uh, and existing non-Indian water uses. Um, the bottom line is that the availability of adequate and reliable water supplies for municipal and industrial uses would also be the basis in Indian country on reservation, just as it is off reservation, uh, but tribes um, typically have a much harder and much more expensive time getting to that basic infrastructure. Um, this is the flow chart of what a typical Indian water rights process looks like. And so you can see why it might take uh, uh, five decades to do um, with all these different players from uh, the state, uh, perhaps multiple states, uh, from the Department of Justice, the Office of Management and Budget within the tribe, um, how the Department of the Interior is involved, and both the House and Senate uh, are involved in the committee process. Um, with different working groups and all that technical information that goes into it uh, to ultimately uh, come up with a piece of congressional legislation that will settle everything. Uh, Fort Belknap, for example, the tribe from the Winters case uh, just had its water rights settlement uh, legislation introduced uh, last month uh, by Senator Steve Daines. Um, now, well more than a hundred years uh, after their water rights are established, uh, they're still not quantified. Um, so how does this present, how does all this background present in this case? Uh, in 2003, the Navajo Nation sued the Department of the Interior, the Secretary of the Interior, the Bureau of Reclamation, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, um, bringing claims under NEPA and a breach of trust claim for their failure to consider the nation's as yet undetermined water rights uh, in their um, management of the Colorado River, arguing that the, the United States had control of their water rights, prevented the nation from asserting its own water rights in Arizona v. California, uh, and that therefore... Uh, there was some attendant trust responsibility for the United States uh, to at least provide an accounting of what the nation's trust assets were in the Colorado River and otherwise. Uh, several parties, including the states of Arizona and Nevada and various um, state water irrigation agricultural uh, districts and authorities uh, intervened, uh, trying to protect their interest in the Colorado River water um, the case has made its uh, way to the Ninth Circuit now several times. Um, the first time, uh, the Ninth Circuit held that the nation lacked Article Three standing to bring its NEPA claims, um, but its breach of trust claim was not barred by the sovereign immunity of the United States and remanded um, the case to district court. Um, and there the Navajo Nation uh, amended their complaint and offered a pretty narrowly tailored prayer for injunctive relief on the breach of trust claim, uh, requesting an order that required the Department of the Interior to determine uh, the nation's uh, water interests, uh, water needs, and to devise a plan to meet those needs. Um, there was no request that the 
United States actually deliver any water or build any infrastructure. It was essentially that kind of basic accounting uh, relief to say, tell us what the assets are that you hold in trust and provide a plan to at least prevent the ongoing uh, incursion uh, into those interests. Um, after reconsidering uh, the amended breach of trust claims, the district court dismissed the Navajo Nation's complaint uh, because in, in their view, uh, in the district court's view, um, any attempt to amend the complaint would be uh, futile. Uh, the district court held that uh, it lacked jurisdiction to decide the claim because the Supreme Court reserved jurisdiction uh, on the allocation of rights in the Colorado River under the Arizona v. California decree. Um, and the district court also held that the nation had not identified any specific treaty, a statute, or regulation that imposed an enforceable trust duty uh, on the United States um, to provide anything like the accounting uh, that the nation had requested. The Navajo Nation appealed, uh, and the Ninth Circuit, uh, in uh, a um, opinion by Judges uh, Gould, Burzon, and Lee, uh, found that the district court erred in dismissing the complaint, uh, that what the Navajo Nation uh, was seeking was narrow, um, would not amount to a judicial uh, quantification of water rights in the Colorado River, um, that it was not barred by race judicata, um, and that the motion to amend um, could be properly considered um, because the complaint properly stated a breach of trust claim uh, premised on the nation's treaties with the United States, the nation's federally reserved winter's rights, and especially uh, when considered with the federal defendants' uh, pervasive control of the Colorado River resources. Um, the very fabulous Judge Ken Lee, uh, my Harvard Law School classmate, class of 2000, uh, wrote separately concurring to emphasize that the Navajo Nation's requested injunctive relief does not implicate the U.S. Supreme Court's retained jurisdiction in Arizona v. California. And he, he essentially said it was narrow enough uh, to survive and the court should consider the claim. Uh, and then um, Arizona and the United States petitioned for certiorari. And AJ will tell us what happened. And I am back with you now. Thank you, uh, Jennifer. That was great. And um, uh, I always have a presumption that most of our viewers are more East Coast than West Coast. I know that's probably not fair. Um, but I also think that most people on the East Coast don't contemplate the water issues that that the West deals with on a consistent and regular basis. Um, we actually just had rain here in Oklahoma City. We've, we've had rain going on um, in and out for the past couple of months, which is great. But uh, many parts of particularly Western Oklahoma live in, in drought or fear of drought on a regular basis. But that doesn't even contemplate some of the issues that are being addressed out uh, in the in even further West in the, in the country. Um, I know I've been through the Navajo Nation myself. I know Jennifer has on many occasions. Um, but you have, for lack of a better term, a, a desert uh, is, is what exists out there, and it's become worse. Uh, there was a political article that I encourage many of you to, to go dig out and, and find out, uh, find that, that talks about there are homes in the Phoenix area that are being built without water. Um, they're being advertised as not having water. Um, that is a very unique and strange thing to most people in this country. But there are million-dollar homes, multi-million-dollar homes in the Phoenix area that are being built that don't have uh, the facilities that are necessary for water to them. And so that's in a multi-million-dollar home in the Phoenix area. What are we talking about when we're talking about the northeastern part of Arizona, um, where there's just not a whole lot. Um, I believe that I, I read recently that um, what we're talking about with the Navajo Nation is equivalent to roughly the size of Connecticut, um, to put it in perspective. Um, 
but it's nothing like Connecticut in its appearance or or um, or infrastructure or anything like that. This is rough territory, and the people that live there are rough and tumble folks, and they are um, really, really um, to be applauded for the work that they've done to continue to survive in a very rough part of um, of our country. But what we really have in this is, is a tale of two cases. I, I know I've said that about other tribal law cases. I know I've said it about the Coach Kennedy case in the past. But this one is a tale of two cases really in what the case is even about. This isn't a, a fact set fight uh, like we had in McGirt, or it's not a fact set fight like we had in Kennedy. This is a fact set fight about what is the case that we're looking at right now. Uh, Justice Kavanaugh's uh, perspective uh, is is one and on, on behalf of the majority um, is is winter's an ongoing obligation. And I think that that's that's something that I think can be bridged between both uh, the majority and the dissent in this is winter's an ongoing obligation. What does that mean for it to be an, an ongoing obligation? How expansive? is that requirement in winters. Um, Justice Kavanaugh really kind of looks at this and, and writes from the perspective for the majority um, that the tribe wants the US to provide additional infrastructure and water supply and um, making sure that that additional infrastructure is in place. I don't know how many of you have been familiar with what's going on in the Colorado River in the Lake Mead area. Um, many of these water supplies that have been traditionally and regularly available for everybody are, are depleting. They're, they're low. They have been in decline for about 30 years. Um, I'm sure scientists um, might say that that will come back at some point. But uh, at this point, it's been 30 years and, uh, and the river volumes have declined and the needs and demands of everybody in the area um, have not only remained where they were 30 years ago, but they've increased. And, and so some of those, some of these issues are becoming more at play as a result of that. And um, the tribe, um, in, in this case, according to the majority, really wants to focus on uh, additional infrastructure, uh, requiring that additional water be provided for the needs of the tribe. Justice Gorsuch doesn't view it quite the same way. Um, he views the case as the tribes want an accounting of the water that is being held in trust for it. Federal government doesn't deny that it holds water in trust for the Navajo, but they have never provided an accounting of what that water volume actually is. And so according to Justice Gorsuch, that's what the tribes are really asking for in this case. Now, I don't think that, um, I, I've as I've looked through this these issues and looked through the opinion and looked through some of the briefing, um, I can see why the reasons are vague. And part of that is because the Navajo weren't necessarily clear in their first uh, complaint in the case. And as Jennifer pointed out earlier in her conversation, um, this was about providing a second amended complaint to be specifically clear about what they wanted. And one of the things that we actually come to in this is, as we go through, um, it, it, this, is, this is from Justice Kavanaugh. According to the Navajos, the United States must do more than simply not interfere with the reserved water rights. The tribe argues that the United States also must take affirmative steps to secure water for the tribe, including by assessing the tribe's water needs, developing a plan to secure the needed water, and potentially building pipelines, pumps, wells, and other water infrastructure. And this is a quote from oral argument on behalf of, from the Council for Navajo Nation. I can't say that the United States obligation to ensure access to water would never require any infrastructure whatsoever. So Justice, Justice Kavanaugh, that's, that's where he's coming from, is some of this confusion. And, and it really is an outgrowth, I think, of the initial complaint in the case and perhaps why the Ninth Circuit wanted to grant the ability to amend the complaint a second time um, to try to clarify that, because I think Justice Gorsuch views the request really more as one um, 
as an accounting. Uh, tell us what we actually own and control. Now, in some other situations, th this is, I think, in the Navajos situation, theirs is about getting the water that they need. Now, there are other situations where if, if this case was brought forward, it may be more of a question of, we already know what water we need. We want to know what sort of rights that we have uh, potentially to sell some of our water. That's not an issue here. And I think that that would be a very different case. And I think that that's something that we would need to look at in a much um, much more different um, approach. What I appreciate about Justice Gorsuch's opinion, as always, is he's very thorough and he walks you down the path to help you understand where he's coming from. He dives into international law to help understand his view of treaties and definition of treaties and why tribal law actually relates to some of the issues um, in Indian law, uh, or I'm sorry, why tribal law um, relates to many of the, the concepts in international law. And I, I think that that's something that that is a very useful thing um, to come out of the dissent for any reader who's trying to kind of understand some of these things, um, or if you're an international law practitioner to see some of these things and how they're captured within, within tribal law. But um, Gujasis Gorsuch also travels down that road of um, the Indian canons themselves and applying them to the case. And one of the things that Justice Gorsuch does as he's going through this approach is he travels down um, the road of discussing the Tucker Act. And he's, he's very clear that the way that this, that this case is decided by the majority, by Justice Kavanaugh, uh, it relies on a, on a statute involved, involving the Tucker Act. And the Tucker Act is, is um, really reserved. Um, uh, there, there, there's a number of, of court opinions, Supreme Court opinions that really kind of look at um, how to apply the Tucker Act within the tribal realm. And that's something that, that um, Justice Gorsuch says that Kavanaugh and the majority misapplied those to this, that those should only be reserved for the Tucker Act. I wish that the majority would have addressed it more thoroughly than dropping a footnote in that, that appears on pages seven and eight. Um, I, I would have liked it be, to, to see that from my perspective, because I really wanted to weigh that a whole lot more. And it's going to require me to kind of dive into it a little bit more um, to kind of fully flesh out that because I, I think that that's on its own a completely different issue that needs to be walked through and addressed. I haven't talked about Justice Thomas's opinion, and, and, and I I think that um, it, it's brief. Uh, it fits with the traditional Justice Thomas view, um, but it's something that worth worth exploring and discussing here because Justice Thomas spends a lot of time talking about trust relationships. And what does that trust relationship look like? We throw around the term, what does it mean? And I think at the end of the day, Justice Thomas's view on, on trust is similar to his view on, on Indian commerce. Uh, he believes, uh, generically speaking, that Article 1, Section 8 lays out what sort of regulatory authority the federal government has in relation to the tribes. Uh, and Justice Thomas believes that that's not much. Um, and I think this opinion that that we're looking at today and is concurring, uh, he kind of views that similar in a he views the trust relationship as a very narrow, um, very um, carefully considered trust relationship and and not much more. In fact, I, I would argue that he maybe says there really isn't much of a trust relationship at all. We shouldn't be even contemplating that. The reason that I bring this up and the reason that I think that is important for our discussion today is because I think within the next term or two, we're actually going to be looking at this concurring opinion from Justice Thomas and applying it to an actual case. And, I, and that case is um, Apache Stronghold um, versus United States. It's currently in the Ninth Circuit, and it's currently, we're, we're waiting any day, really, for an opinion to come out of that court um, on that case. It, it's one that delves into free exercise and tribal use of free exercise uh, on, on federal government land. But the, the 
second issue in that case is really, is there a generic trust that is owed uh, by the government to members of a tribe, I think in this situation in Apache Stronghold, um, and, and what is that and how can it be quantified? And so that case, no matter who wins, uh, that there will be a cert request uh, out of the Ninth Circuit for that one. And it will uh, address squarely some of these trust issues that I think Justice Thomas is uh, addressing. And, and we'll find out perhaps uh, if he's got four other justices that agree with him or, or if not. And so um, I think I'm going to stop there so that we can kind of have some back and forth. But um, I look forward to your questions if you insert them in the Q&A or the chat. And uh, Jennifer, what, what did I get wrong? I don't think you got anything wrong, uh, AJ. It was very uh, thorough. Um, Tom Getty already has a question for us, um, which is, should the tribe have limited itself to seeking a plan to develop water and not allow the court to think that the tribe really, really uh, wanted the feds to secure water? Would it have made any difference to Justice Kavanaugh? Um, my answer to that is no, it wouldn't have made any um, difference to Justice Kavanaugh. And I actually have a meme for this. Um, <laughs> this is Justice Kavanaugh on Indian law. Um, show me the text. He couldn't scream it uh, any louder. Um, he wants to see it in the text. And, and I think that was fundamentally his problem here uh, is that um, while he could see what was in the treaty, um, he's struggling with a difficult issue that the court often uh, faces when um, they're uh, seeking to translate historical meaning based on changes in the surrounding context. And lots of scholars like uh, Professor Lawrence Lessig have, have written about that uh, in the constitutional context, and certainly the court struggles with it in the Indian law context. and they take a lot of their cues from the Department of Justice, which was firmly against the Navajo Nation here. Uh, and that, that was indeed the headline in Arizona was Biden triumphs over tribe, um, which is a pretty unappealing headline for this administration. And uh, I think highlights the difficulty when the United States is wearing uh, multiple hats here. Um, and, and I think uh, the majority also struggles to see the trust responsibility as the bargain for benefit that the tribes uh, tend to see it as. Um, here, you know, the Navajo Nation <clears throat> ceded its lands permanently uh, for a permanent, uh, albeit dysfunctional, uh, protection and trust relationship uh, with the United States. Um, there should be some continuing federal uh, responsibility to provide, um, you know, consistency, uh, to provide at least an accounting of what the assets are that the, the federal government uh, is protecting. Um, but the United States Department of Justice here argued, well, no, because we're a sovereign and that's different. Uh, that makes us different than any other uh, trustee. And <clears throat> at the end of the day, Justice Kavanaugh and the majority agree with that and say, okay, show us the text. If you think there's a duty on the executive branch to do something, show me the text in the treaty, show me the text in the statute. Congress, you do this all the time. You act to protect tribal rights. Show me a statute now that says the, the Secretary of the Interior has a duty to do this. Um, and they're not finding any because I think, honestly, as the Navajo Nation describes it, everybody understood that you need water to live in a permanent homeland where you're going to engage in agriculture. Yeah, I my, my answer to Tom um, is I, I don't want to speak for Justice Kavanaugh. Do I think that it would have made a difference to Justice Kavanaugh? But as I, I told Jennifer, Jennifer and I got on the phone, we talked about um, this case yesterday uh, at length. And... Uh, Justice Ferrati, at least, would it would make a difference uh, to me. I, I am, um, if I'm looking at the case from the perspective of the majority and the way that the majority looked at this case, 
I, I think I agree with the majority. But if I'm looking at this case the way that Justice Gorsuch looked at this case, um, with really a completely different perspective, um, I, I think I agree with Justice Gorsuch. Do, do the tribes actually deserve to know and have a quantified perspective on uh, what water is held in trust for them? I, I think there's probably a good question about that. I'd like to hear an argument specifically uh, about that. Um, and, and so I, I, I think that at least to me, it makes a difference. I, I don't know if it makes a difference to Justice Kavanaugh. I probably tend to think along the lines with Jennifer that it probably does not, um, but it does make a difference to me. I'm, I'd, I'd like to hear that argument about um, uh, from both sides, from, from uh, Department of Justice, as, as well as, as from the Navajo about why or why not that water shouldn't be quantified in trust for the tribes. Um, let me talk uh, about uh, Jennifer's um, uh, meme, which was funny. And, and there was more to it that we're not going to show as well, but we were laughing about it earlier. Um, show me the text. And I, and I think that this opens up a larger question about tribal law. And I think Justice Gorsuch took us actually down this road in, in McGirt. Show me the text. Where is the specific text? And that grew out into Justice Kavanaugh's opinion in Castro Huerta. Um, and, and it appears here again uh, in this case. And really, I, I think it's where the majority of the court is generally comfortable. Like it comes out of Justice Scalia's textualism that he really uh, wrote about at length. Um, and, and I think that many on this court, a, a large portion on this court, adhere to that textualism that is at issue um, and that we're dealing with. We haven't done that in tribal law over the years. But I think that the real question is, and we need one that we need to contemplate, is where is that starting point that we're going to start our textualism? Because I, I think Justice Scalia even admitted it from time to time that uh, tribal law is made up. It's whatever we kind of feel like is the right thing to do here and there. Um, and there was no consistency. So where do we start our textualism? Do we start it back in 1900? Do we go all the way back um, to the 1800s? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. But I think at this point, the court also doesn't know the answer to that. And I think they're just saying, here's the starting point. We're doing textualism now. And they're not necessarily going back and, and contemplating when does that textualism begin. And I want to dovetail off that um, to something I said in the Holland v. Brackeen uh, courthouse steps um, the week before last, which is really, you know, the court's the best it's ever been on Indian law now. That's been true in all their questioning. It's been true in the briefing and advocacy to the court. It's been true in their opinions where they're they're really taking a much deeper dive than the court ever has. It's in the past, it's been very shoot from the hip. Um, in fact, when I was a student in law school, we heard from faculty members who had clerked on the court that they would draw straws to see which clerk had to work on the Indian cases because they were the most dreaded thing that nobody cared about or or wanted to participate in. And I think, it, we've come 180 degrees from that, where now people are very engaged uh, in these matters and the role of tribes in our federalism. And in uh, Justice Gorsuch's concurring opinion, uh, parts two and four in the Holland v. Brackeen, he traced exactly where the court came off the rails, deviating from the Constitution, deviating from the text, and just making it up. And the court's been just making it up for a good 150 years. Um, and now they've realized they're in a hole and they've decided to stop digging. And so for, I think the majority of the court, that means no sudden moves, do as little as possible. Don't change the status quo. Uh, let's just try to stand still like a kid who's gotten caught doing something naughty and they just are like, what? I didn't do anything. <laughs> that's That's kind of where the majority is. And you've got Justice Gorsuch saying, no, here's what we did wrong and here's how we can fix it. And it's to just stick to the Constitution like glue, because this uh, reflects the grand bargain of tribal sovereignty and the government to government relationship and the failed experience, experiments of the Articles of Confederation. And here's the plan. It's all right there. All we have to do is stick to it. 
And Justice Thomas, as he's been doing consistently now for decades, says, I don't buy any of that. <laughs> I, you know, as, as AJ said, his view is that the Indian Commerce Clause power is very narrow uh, and that any other specific obligations, as he says in his concurring opinion here, are the result of very specific treaties. Tribes are not a monolith. There's, there's no such thing as a generic set of rights that applies to all tribes, but there may be very specific promises and specific statutes and in various uh, and various treaties that that actually give rise to some enforceable obligations. But I think you're seeing the whole court reject the idea of the free floating or unmoored. Free floating is the word they used in Holland v. Brackeen four times. Um, and, and you see uh, synonyms for that throughout this opinion, where they're trying to tie Indian law to something solid. And I just don't think a majority has yet decided that Justice Gorsuch's view of the world is a something solid. Um, they're just trying to not keep digging. They're, they are... Um... Uh, I, I'm thinking of a sponge. They're trying to to find something solid and moor it on a sponge. I think is is um, the picture that I have in my head. Something you said actually goes very well with um, the next question from Nathan in here, um, and I and I think I'll answer Nathan's question where he says, "What implications, if any, does this case have for identifying other trust relationships between the U.S. and tribes?" And, and I and I think that. I'm going to use Jennifer's words to, to answer that question, uh, is I think a lot of this is going to be dependent on the treaty. And uh, I think we started to see that. We saw that in Cougar Den. We saw that in Herrera versus Wyoming a few years ago. Um, you know, what treaties have the language in them that the Yakima have, that um, commerce can be conducted and, you, and the travel off of the reservation will be allowed? Um what treaties have the language in it that we had in Herrera, where um, tribal members may hunt, uh, you know, to to provide themselves sustenance? Those are the sort of things that I think that we have to look at specifically treaty by treaty. I don't think that that um, saying some of these things generically, particularly after this case. Uh, I, I think after this case, the, the court has said, we want to see what's in the treaty. We don't want it to be some amorphous theoretical thing. We want to see what's actually in the treaty and what is the basis of your statement that the U.S. owes you a particular um, particular thing or not. And, and I think beyond that, as the majority says, uh, we encourage you to go to Congress and ask for that. And I, and I know that, in fact... Um, that was actually a pretty decent statement right up front from Kavanaugh. Um, over the decades, the federal government has taken various steps to assist the people of the Western states with their water needs. The Solicitor General explains that for the Navajo tribe in particular, federal government has secured hundreds of thousands of acre feet of water and authorized billions of dollars for water in infrastructure. Um, and they cite a, a number of uh, bases for that. Um, clearly the Navajo uh, seem to want to know more about what that is and what else goes along with it, uh, I think, as part of this case. Um, but that's an example, I think, of, of, again, the courts may not always be the best place for this. It may be a process of going through Congress to just simply get appropriations. And that's where I think um, Justice Gorsuch has done uh, you know, great service to Indian country in explaining the history, explaining the considerations um, in a way that is relatable and understandable for anyone. Um, when he, in his concurring opinion, says the Navajo Nation is in the world's longest running DMV line, everybody uh, can, can relate to that. Uh, when he says, look, when they started this, uh, Elvis was still on the Ed Sullivan show. I mean, th this has been a lifetime um, you know, multiple lifetimes now encompassed by trying to get somebody, anybody uh, to help them. And so, you know, after the, after receiving this, what is the Navajo Nation to do now, <laughs> right? Are they going to, are they supposed to go engage more with the secretary in a political process? Well, they've been doing that for a hundred years. Are they supposed to go seek help from Congress? They've been doing that for a hundred years. Are they going to file a new case 
uh, with a new, even more narrowly tailored complaint? Maybe. How long is that going to run? This case started in 2003. Um, this is current events by water rights standards. Um, or would they do what Justice Alito questioned at oral argument? What's to stop them from going and sticking a straw in the Colorado River? Stop asking permission and start begging forgiveness. Go get your water. Um, I, asked, I asked Jennifer that question yesterday, and, and I, I didn't realize that Justice Alito had asked that question. But I, yeah, maybe maybe we need to give the tribes the ability to secure their own water. And I would argue that tribes already have that inherent sovereign ability Agreed. to secure their water. Um, what tribes typically don't have is the funding to actually construct the infrastructure necessary. But you know, we're in an era of self-determination where that's changing, where tribes are uh, developing their natural resources, they're developing their economies in very diversified ways. And there will come a day when tribes have that ability to do that. And you know, what are they going to do? Send in the National Guard to say, stop taking the water? I mean, at the end of the day, it, everyone, as all the opinions point out, this, this is not a factual dispute, as, as AJ said. Everybody agrees there's treaty protected early priority water rights of a large but undetermined magnitude in the Colorado River for the Navajo Nation. And the longer... <laughs> everyone continues to play see no, hear no, speak no uh, with the Navajo water rights, the worse the problem gets and the harder the consequences will be for everyone when the Navajo nation does uh, assert its water rights, whether uh, by permission or begging forgiveness. I, I see we've got one more question. It looks like we got like two minutes. The question uh, is, can you think of an example where a regulation, not a treaty, would contain rights creating or duty imposing language? Uh, the Supreme Court casts its holding in terms larger than just treaties. Uh, the federal government must expressly accept trust responsibilities in a treaty statute or regulation uh, that contains a rights creating or duty imposing language. Um, the Indian Mineral Development Act regulations are a good example um, that have been before the court before, where in regulation, um, the Department of the Interior takes on a lot of very specific managerial duties with respect to leasing and accounting for mineral uh, royalties. Um, <laughs> that, and that's a Navajo issue right now, too, Jennifer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Back next year. Um, so, <laughs> Uh, there are lots of places where um, in carrying out federal statutes for ma broad management of resources, the, the Department of the Interior or the Department of Agriculture, for example, have taken on lots of responsibilities uh, to do certain things. And the courts you know, and the lower courts have addressed those kinds of things very specifically. I'd say it happens pretty routinely um, certainly, that was the case in the in the Mitchell cases, the the tribal timber resource management. Um, it, you know, federal law is replete. You know, the, all of 25 CFR and Title 25 of the code are about Indians. So there's a lot in there uh, to hit the, for tribes to hang their hat on. Yeah, I I agree, and I know we're running short on time, so I'll just say I agree. Well, thank you all very very much for being with us today. Um, thank you in particular to Jennifer and AJ for joining us on this case and uh, throughout the recent Supreme Court term on a bunch of different cases um, throughout the process. As always, please keep an eye on your emails uh, and our website for upcoming events. And if you do have any questions or comments, you can reach out to us at info at fed-soc.org. Uh, with that, thank you all so much for being with us today. We are adjourned.